Hello, a very warm welcome to everyone joining us live from the seabed. We are currently on board the research vessel GeoSARS for our expedition benchmark, Benthic Habitats of the Denmark Straits. We are currently in Icelandic waters, approximately 130 kilometres west from the northwest tip of Iceland, and we are directly on the Arctic Circle, about 66.3 degrees north. My name is Emmeline Broad. I'm a researcher based at the Zoological Society of London, and I'm joined by the leaders of this expedition, Dr. Chris Yesen, a research fellow at the Zoological Society of London, and Dr. Julian Burgos. We also have Steinem Olafsdottir. Both Julian and Steinem are researchers from the Marine and Freshwater Institute of Iceland. And additionally, we have Nanette Hamrakin Arbo joining us from the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources. Firstly, we would like to acknowledge our funders of this expedition, Eurofleets, for the use of the RV, GeoSARS and the remotely operated vehicle, Agear 6000. They are provided free of charge for this expedition as part of the Eurofleets Plus project funded by the European Union's H2020 Research and Innovation Programme under Grant Agreement 824077. A big thank you as well to the Marine Stewardship Council. This expedition will contribute towards research conducted by Chris and I, funded by the Ocean Stewardship Fund, documenting vulnerable marine ecosystems in Greenland. If you have any questions, please use the comments section on Facebook. We will do our best to answer as much as possible. Um, and one person or object I need to introduce uh, is Agear 6000, our remotely operated vehicle, or ROV. Um, give us a wave. <laughs> um, Chris, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the ROV and, and what we've been using it for. Yeah, so um, the, the ROV is a, um, a remote camera system. So um, it has a, a total of nine cameras. I think that was right, guys. Tell me. Um, and uh, we have. Uh, uh, propellers and uh, rover arm and uh, a little vacuum cleaner that you might even see later that uh, um, allows us to take samples and uh, there's a storage area at the bottom we're just panning around to see it oh uh, we can see another a second arm and a little tray at the base and uh, a little bit later on we'll be collecting a, uh, some samples and placing them in the in the drawer and this will uh, allow us to bring these samples up from 600 meters depth back up to the surface. You can see the little um, um, information bar at the top of the screen and that uh, gives us details about the position and the depth of the vehicle so that we can um, uh, exactly pinpoint um, where we are and where we're taking our samples from. We're in um, very deep um, and very cold waters. Uh, we just uh, conducted a um, temperature profile here. And uh, although the surface is just under six degrees uh, down at the seabed, we're uh, just below freezing. But the pressure uh, means that um, this water isn't going to freeze. This water is kind of um, a, a, a current coming from um, the north. So this is cold Arctic water. Um, it created a bit of a problem for us um, a couple of days ago. Uh, the currents at the seabed were so strong that we couldn't operate the ROV. But thankfully, thankfully today, um, we're, um, we're all good and we can see this uh, beautiful seabed. Cool, thank you. So Julian, perhaps you can explain a little bit what brings us to this beautiful region of the deep seabed. Hi, yes. Um, well, thank you for organizing uh, this uh, live event. We are super excited to be able to share uh, our observations from the seabed with everyone. Um, so, as you said, now we are in, in Denmark Strait, what in, in Iceland we know as Grenlandsund. Uh, that's the area between Iceland and Greenland. And it's an area that is um, very interesting for us. It has a, um, a very dynamic water masses. As Chris says here, the cold uh, water from the Arctic meets the less cold or warmer water from the North Atlantic. Uh, so there's a, a very big differences in water temperature near the bottom, very uh, differences in the type of seabed that you can find, um, and the current speed. 
So then this means that um, the habitats that we found on the seabed are very different if we move to in different places. So, um, but uh, this area has not been studied very much. We have um, several sources of information telling us that the the um, benthic communities, the communities on the seabed, are, are very diverse. Um, but uh, except for some uh, video dives on the coast of uh, Iceland and a few on the uh, close to Greenland, most of the areas in Denmark Strait has never been filmed or photographed before. So. Basically, now we are doing um, uh, yeah, um, exploration in the most basic sense. We are actually seeing and uh, describing these uh, communities for the first time. That's great. Thank you very much. So, um, generally, what are we expecting to find down here? I know that you have done some trawls before and some video work in areas similar to this. Do you feel that we're going to find habitats that are dominated by sponges and deep cold water corals as well? Yes, that's uh, one of our main uh, um, uh, points of interest is uh, habitats that are uh, complex uh, and they're dominated by uh, sponges and corals. Uh, we have several sources of information showing us that uh, you know in some places we could find some of these habitats, the kind of habitats that people uh, refer to as uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems. Uh, these are places where uh, there's a lot of animals that could be damaged if we do, for example, bottom trolling. So it's very important for us and for the management, both in Iceland and Greenland, to be able to find where these very rich seabed uh, areas are so we can work to protect them. So, um, and we're lucky because uh, in this place we are right now, we have found uh, a very diverse community of sponges and corals, um, the kind of thing that we uh, selected the name Svamporg, which is sponge city, <laughs> because of the number of, of species and the density that we see. And um, so very, we are very, very happy about uh, finding this uh, type of habitats. So we're probably going to lift off in a second and have a bit more of a look around. Um, as you can see, there's quite a dense community of dermo sponge and um, soft cold water coral here. Um, a number of dermo sponge species and soft cold water coral species are protected um, under international law and this is one of the things that um, can uh, come out of work like this. So I think we're good to go. Stop So we're just powering the rov off the seabed now and we're actually going to start to have a little look around this area. Um, Chris, currently on the rock we've got a Gorgonocephalus, you know a little bit about this. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, just, to the, just to the right of the screen, um, so, yep, yeah. the right of the screen there, um, we've got a basket star um, and uh, they're named uh, after uh, Greek mythology, the Gorgons, um, you might remember Clash of the Titans and the Medusa. Um, so it, the name literally means a dreaded head. Uh, and uh, uh, it's like snakes uh, for hair. And uh, it's a pretty cool animal, but uh, how big, anyone know how big they can get to? Yeah, maybe. But this can be over 10 centimeters. Yeah. The disc, yeah, and the arms, of course, is Yeah. So the dog on the disc. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so lots of people putting their arms out to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so fifty centimeters. Yeah. 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 Fifty. Yeah. Yeah. It only has five arms, but its arms is like set, uh, yeah, and branches. Branching now. and branching again and branching again. That makes it like this. Uh, basket form. Yeah, so it's a relative of uh, the starfish, hence the name uh, basket star. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've got some really nice sponges underneath that. We um, actually managed to get a sample of those yesterday, didn't we, Skynum? 
The white ones? The, yeah, the white one underneath the yeah, rock. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's glass sponges. It's like base form glass sponges. It's quite... Um, you haven't identified them. Um, species now? Yeah, it's quite difficult to identify directly to species because a lot of the things that we're finding here are still relatively undescribed or if they've been brought up using um, different methods, they don't tend to look like what they look like now, yeah. which is one of the benefits of using, using the ROV or the remotely operated vehicle. Yeah, um, um, most of the work uh, that's been done on samples here are based on um, trawl surveys and uh, if you can imagine taking a large net and uh, uh, dragging it across the seabed here, everything's going to get totally bundled and squashed and so, and then brought up from 600 meters uh, and the strong pressure there up to the surface. And so what we, what we normally get to see when we're, when we're on deck um, and are pretty mangled and squashed specimens and they don't, they don't retain the, the beauty and, and, and often they don't retain the colors that you can see here. I mean, um, the, the really remarkable thing uh, that, that kind of strikes me is when I'm looking at uh, this, this uh, incredibly dark um, environment is all the bright colors and the wide variety of colors and shapes that you can see on the seabed. It, uh, I personally find it really amazing. You can also, the advantage of having a video on the, on the seafloor is that you can see the communities and how the different species are interacting with each other. Well, we actually have a question about the community. Um, we have a question that says, at what point would you call a community diverse a certain number of species? Yes, <laughs> that's a very good question. So, yeah, it's always a relative term to me. So. Uh, it's not diverse versus non-diverse. It's basically it's a gradient, um, but this uh, this location has a very high number of species compared to other places that we've known. So, and then I also think we should explain the two red dots on the screen, uh, yeah, uh, which is yes. laser lights, and the distance between them are ten centimeters. And that enables us to uh, m uh, measure the things that we can see in the screen. Thank you, Nanetta. Yeah. Nanetta, how does this look different to some of the imagery you've seen around the western coast of Greenland, or is it pretty similar? Uh, well, I think there's much more uh, troll fishery going on in western Greenland, but we have found uh, yeah, habitats like this also in Western Greenland, so so it's not that different. So, but but I think I mean I think it often depends on what kind of sediment is there. So if you're having sessile organisms organisms <laughs> which has to be fastened to something like rocks then you need rocks for that to be there. If you have mud ground, then you see another completely different habitat and with different organisms connected to it. Yeah, um, uh, a few days ago, we uh, did some surveys uh, in Greenland, Greenlandic waters on a um, um, muddy seabed and we saw some uh, really nice sea, uh, sea pens and got some really amazing um, um, photographs of uh, this, uh, this uh, <coughs> very large sea pen called uh, an umbellula uh, and the Greenlandic fishermen call them sea, sea flowers, is that right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sea flowers. <laughs> oh, or in... in, in uh, soup lobster. No, I don't think that's what they call it. No? <laughs> We've got a couple more questions coming through. Um, is there documented fishing slash damage around this area that may endanger this section of the seabed? We, uh, no, there is not uh, any fisheries going on in this particular place. Yeah. Um, we yeah. have fisheries close to this, but uh, it's a bit uh, in a shallower ground than this one. Is that because of legislation or is that because of the rough terrain? Uh, I it's neither actually. I think it's because the water moss here is really cold, much colder than just if you're in like 200 meters depth just close by here. Yeah. This is the Arctic water moss 
dominating here, and that means that the fish that they are uh, um, targeting, yeah, it doesn't thrive. Uh, it doesn't want to be in this cold water. That's why they don't go here. Right in the middle of the screen, we've got a pygnogonid or sea spider. It's, it's, can we see it on that screen? Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. great. They're one of my favourites. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I think it should it should be saying that even though there's like there's no commercial fisheries here, we are fairly close to one of the heaviest fishing areas in Iceland. Mm -hmm. We are uh, about uh, just a few kilometers in shallow waters. Mm -hmm. So um, this highlights the necessity of protect habitats like this because uh, today uh, there is no fishing going on, but that doesn't mean that in the near future it could be. So um, should we should we uh, start describing what we can see? Yeah, so I think it's good if we can. Yeah. So we took a sample of this sponge um, yesterday. It's very similar. Yeah, it's listed in I guess. Mm -hmm. But this one does it have a common name? Um, I think there's something to call it net sponge. <laughs> well, to me, it looks like a brain. Yeah. <laughs> So often, often um, uh, we we have uh, common names as well as scientific names for for uh, these um, animals, um, where you know the, the common names are very descriptive and uh, kind of you know describe what you see. So the uh, the corals that we see, are, we often call them cauliflower corals um, or sometimes broccoli corals. Although um, sometimes we see them white, but the um, obviously you don't get a lot of bright purple cauliflower. No. <laughs> well, can we uh, find one of those? And, uh, so this pink this pink um, specimen here is a cauliflower coral in the middle of the screen. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, common names here yeah, we can apply to, to lots of different creatures. So the, the little um, lattice uh, um, at the bottom of the screen, can we see that one? Yeah. Uh, so this, uh, this is called a, a lace coral, but uh, it's actually not a coral at all. It's a kind of uh, um, bryozoa. It's a different colonial animal. Um, we, again, we took up some um, nice examples of these um, in a kind of tree form on some rocks um, a couple of days ago, and I'm sure we'll be posting them on our blog uh, at some point soon. Can we zoom out a bit? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, can we see the feather star? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Same uh, so uh, here we can see uh, a feather star, uh, a crinoid. Uh, again, the, the common name says exactly what you see. It's, it's, uh, it looks a bit starry and uh, feathery arms. Again, it's a filter feeding animal. But these can actually uh, uh, swim. Uh, uh, and so uh, sometimes when we when we disturb them or sampling, um, they they swim off uh, so that they don't get taken to the surface. Um. We've got a question regarding the colour of some species. So what's the advantage of being coloured in such a dark place? Uh, yeah, so that's a co that's a question that uh, that we often get that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 used to stump me, but um, uh, the, the, the answer that I give now is that a lot of these creatures, although we find them in the deep sea, they're closely related to organisms that we also find in shallow waters, and uh, they don't they don't necessarily lose their colour, um, but but they're just they're just relatives to, to shallow water uh, shallow water species that that do live in light where um, uh, colour might be important, but also. Um, uh, some of these creatures can actually uh, produce their own light and bioluminesce. Um, and we, uh, uh, we, we actually did some experiments with uh, a sea pen um, a, a couple of days ago. We brought one to the surface and uh, they bioluminesce under, under um, 
uh, what's the word? So when you rub them. So, uh, so we, we agitated the stem. Well, agitation, we, that's We the tried word. with the ROV arm first. That did nothing. Or our camera isn't sensitive enough to pick up the light that it emits. But in the lab, um, with all the lights off and basically in a cupboard, um, you can see it sort of luminesce slightly. Yes. yes. So, so, so we had a lot of fun in a dark room, <laughs> feverishly rubbing sea pens. So if you want to be a marine biologist. <laughs> But here's a great example of, uh, of, of one of the cauliflower corals, bright purple. Unfortunately, when you bring them to the surface and uh, preserve them, they really lose their colour and turn into a kind of brown or creamy... Um, Whitish. Yes, yeah. yeah. And that's the cauliflower. Yes. Yeah. 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 We have a question about um, whether the uh, exploration activities leave any impact on the habitat besides withdrawal of the specimens. Well. This, this kind of um, work, like the one we're doing now, basically uh, it doesn't leave any impact, uh, except, as, as you say, uh, for the specimens that we take. Um, other kind of surveys, like troll surveys, have a bigger footprint, uh, but, um, but we try to make them you know, as, as minimum as possible. Um, but that's one of the nice things about using an ROV with the manipulator tools like Agil 6000 is that we can actually really be very specific about what we take from the seabed uh, and really select the species that we want to obtain and, and try to uh, uh, yeah, avoid any additional uh, impacts on the seabed. That, that's a great segue into some sampling. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, uh, should we should we try to uh, try to uh, do some sampling? Yeah. Now? So um, we've we've been working through a, a particular type of um, well a bit of a list of specimens that we've had on images that we've not been able to ID, and, and this is the reason why we sample. Um, these animals are extremely difficult to ID from images alone. We need to be able to look at their body um, organization so with the sponges that's um, they have a particular type of formation using um, spicules um, and also we use a DNA as well to characterize different species and sometimes the morphology can be um, the same as another another species so um, now in order to fully characterize the biodiversity in this area we will take small samples from um, different species and we will bring them up to the surface and characterize them. Yeah, um, and uh, often I I even if you have uh, a, a specimen in your hand, you still can't uh, uh, um, reliably identify it. It really relies on very good reference material uh, for comparison and often you need a microscope. So the spicules that um, Emmy was speaking about are essentially tiny little um, tiny little shards of glass that the sponge used to make up its body and you need to examine those under a microscope to look at the shape um, and the um, arrangement in order to um, 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 correctly identify these things. Do we have any sampling requests here? Well we've been looking at the polymastids. Yeah? Yeah. So potentially we could take another one of those. Um, I mean, the disc one. Yeah. yeah. Should we use Which the one? vacuum? Yeah. Yeah. The disc one. Oh. The round spans in the top. Yeah. In the top. Brown and yellow. Mm. So this is where um, our expert ROV pilots really show their worth. Um, <laughs> um, but it takes it takes a lot of uh, uh, training and uh, 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 expertise to be able to operate one of these uh, things. Um, do, do we have a price tag on on <laughs> the Aegir six thousand? How much money did it cost? Twenty million. Twenty million. Bucks. So that's two thousand. No, two two million. Two million. Two million pound vehicle. Um, so you know, simple scientists like us <laughs> would, 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 won't be let near it um, yeah. um, uh, because you know uh, 
<laughs> we don't have the training. I wish we should say that we were like very pleasantly surprised about how easy it was for them to actually get the samples that that we wanted. Um, when we were planning this cruise, we were uh, allocating a lot of time for sampling because we thought that it was going to be very difficult, but actually it has been uh, yeah fairly easy. So uh, this is a very a very good thing. And that's because the yeah the, the training and the ability of the pilots. So maybe explain a little bit about what's going to happen now. What what we're doing here with the the suction hose. So so um, the, you can see the can you can you see yeah, yeah. So the robot arm has picked up this hose, and the and the hose is going to essentially. Um, uh, uh, suck up uh, a specimen and draw it directly into a containment tank uh, at the back of the ROV. And so it's a matter of um, uh, picking it up and pointing it in, in the right way, uh, quite a lot like uh, vacuuming. Um, but obviously we want that to be uh, very localised and only just to pick up the, 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 the animals that we want to sample. It can be it can be uh, a, a, a slow process, um, but you know um, it, it's very deep water. Uh, it's a long way away, and uh, it's very difficult conditions to work in. What do you want? To do? Bottom right. Yeah. Right. It's got the spikes on the top. Zoom in a bit, zoom in. Yeah, yep, zoom, zoom in. in. Yeah. It's, uh, it's right under the hoover. Yeah, top right hand corner. If you go a little bit back. Yeah. This one there? Yeah. yeah. Looks like a bottle. So once again, thank you for joining us live from the seabed while we are setting up the sampling. I just wanted to ask if anybody has any questions, please feel free to post them on the stream. We are trying to get to as many as possible um, whilst also manipulating all the uh, ROV equipment here in the um, control room. And here we go. So this is, uh, we think this is a, a polymastia? Oh, yeah. yeah, polymastid uh, sponge. Uh, they're quite characteristic by the um, the little points on top of them. So, uh, the, the name polymastia actually means many nipples. We can try and pick up the look otherwise. Yeah, some, sometimes we need to scrap it uh, from the rock where they're attached. There we go. Excellent. Yeah. I think sponges are my favourite animal. I think everybody knows that though. <laughs> Julian, have you got a wish list for anything that you would like to have seen or that ha you have seen so uh, far? Yes, I was actually really looking forward to see the umbellula, this uh, sort of giant. Um, uh, oh, what is the English name? Yeah, sipens. Um, the um, I've never seen them uh, live in a video. Uh, this can be, they basically look like flowers and they can be up to three meter high. Um, and we were lucky that um, a couple of days ago in Greenlandic waters, uh, we found a place with very soft bottom, which is the kind of bottom that these animals like. Um, and we saw some beautiful uh, examples of umbellula. Which number? So an, an important part of the the process um, of doing the science is not just uh, um, we're not just here sitting and watching television, but we're also taking records of of, of what we're observing and what we're sampling. Um, 
so that um, we can tie things back. Um, uh, as I said, often when things come up to the surface, they don't look the same as when they're on the seabed. So when we're sampling here, we're keeping a record. We're putting things in different trays so that we can uh, tie back the specimen in hand with the specimen that we've seen in the video. And in that way, we're developing our catalogs of, of, um, of animals that we've seen. And, and uh, we can then develop um, uh, identification guides. And that's uh, a work that the guys in uh, Iceland and Greenland have been doing. Um, to, to document and um, formally record all of the um, animals in the area. I've got a question regarding um, sponges. Are they able to filter anthropogenic pollutants and also they, are they affected by sea temperature rise like corals? Filtering pollutants, anyone? Well, I've never read anything about them filtering pollutants, but I think perhaps it's something that we just haven't looked at yet. Um, and with regards to changing climate, I mean, obviously they draw silica from seawater to build their bodies. So I guess if um, there is less silica available due to changing the conditions, then that will affect the way that they grow and, and reproduce. Yeah, also some sponges are very specific about the, their temperature that they like to live. So when we see, when we start to see uh, changes in temperature in the, in the seabed, then some communities will very likely to change. Um, so yes, we are expecting to see uh, changes because of climate change and um, this, uh, the, the kind of data that we're collecting right now will contribute to um, efforts in monitoring uh, the seabed because we don't, we don't only need to see it once, we need to keep an eye on these habitats regularly so we can see if they're changing or not. We haven't seen much um, impact of litter on the seabed here. We've seen a, a couple of, I believe, uh, fishing uh, litter, but nothing too predominant, have we? Yeah, no, we have seen very little. Uh, yeah, tr uh, yeah, litter. Um, I think in part because we are far away from land, and there's not a lot of fishing activity going in this area. So, uh, so. That's why we are able to find these habitats in a very pristine and uh, yeah, a very pristine condition. So somebody's asked a question about whether we've been taking samples of the sediment and have we looked for microplastics. Um, this this cruise has been um, really focused on imaging the seabed and taking samples of um, any unknown specimens for us to characterise these habitats fully. So um, we haven't been taking sediment samples, but there are other cruises at the moment um, and expeditions on the Denmark Strait that are taking samples of the sediment for various um, different aspects. So um, I'm believe that some of that will be used to characterise whether microplastics have made it out this far. Yeah. 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 Can we stop at the Arconian in the bottom there? Uh, yeah. 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 So one of the uh, uses that we're gonna, um, yeah, one of the objectives of the cruise is to generate the data that uh, later we were going to use to map these habitats and that's a very important thing that uh, we do on this type of activities uh, when we um, go to the seabed we can only see a little bit of the seabed every time uh, but we need to know how far these habitats extend um, so there's uh, will be afterward when we go back home there will be a lot of work analyzing the data and doing these uh, predictive models of the habitats, so we can actually create maps of the area, and we can decide about protection measurements um, based on the extension of the habitats. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a good it's a good point that um, uh, although we're getting really awesome um, pictures here, um, we might do a transect, and that transect might go on for a couple of hours, and we might cover yeah yeah five hundred meters yeah. to a yeah. kilometer at most. Yeah. And that's gonna that's gonna see a tiny speck of 
of the the vastness of of the seabed here. So we can't ever hope to visualize the entire seabed. And here we're going to be at sea for ten days. We're going to conduct twenty or thirty dives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's going to give us um, uh, uh, twenty or thirty um, uh, kilometers of, of, of transect, but um, and that's covering an area of many thousands of square kilometers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a tiny fraction of one percent. Yeah. Even the most uh, basic uh, 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 seabed observations, um, detailed seabed mapping, which is something that we can do. Uh, from from the ship without a camera using um, uh, uh, multi beam echo sounders, um, we, we can kind of go up and down and essentially do a kind of lawnmower type surveys where we're um, measuring the depth of the sea below us. Um, but even that most basic survey in Iceland, only thirty percent of the waters have been fully multi beamed. I think David told me. Uh, yeah. yesterday yeah. Yeah. and and they have a, a 10 year program going uh, yeah. at the moment and th that won't be finished at the end of 10 years no 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 just just to clarify um, <clears throat> people watching might not understand or know what multi beam is so can you quickly just give an overview of how we conduct mapping in the in the ocean yeah so um, when we do this the first thing that we need to do is to map what we call the topography or the shape of, or, of the seabed. So, um, so for that we use an acoustic uh, equipment called a multi-beam echo sounder, which is um, basically it's like a I like to imagine it as a fan of uh, flashlights, but instead of showing light to the bottom, they show they emit sound, and the sound bounces on the bottom, and uh, that gives you a measurement of how deep the seabed is at that place. So when we start to go in back and forth with the ship, we can get a continuous uh, map of the seabed um, with a lot of detail actually on how deep or how shallow the area is. And also if the seabed is um, hard, like rocky or if it's soft, so if it's made of sand or mud. Um, and that's a, a very important first step, but uh, that doesn't tell us anything about which kind of animals do they live in that area. So the next step after that is to come out with cameras and and uh, and try to list the, the species that we see in every place, and then trying to identify which communities or which ecosystems they belong to. And then the third step is when we have to just put all the information together to create these maps. Um, and that involves a lot of statistical analysis and, and modeling work, uh, because as Chris, as Chris said, we're only watching a tiny little bit of the of the of the seabed, and and it's quite challenging to make a, com a complete map. Uh, I like to imagine like uh, if we want to make a map of Iceland or the UK or Greenland from an airplane and just taking flying up top and just taking a few pictures here and there and then you want to make a complete map out of that so it's very difficult um, but it's an essential tool because we cannot protect things that we don't know where they are and how long uh, yeah how far they extend um, yeah so that's why several programs in in Iceland in the marine and freshwater research institute and in, in Greenland also and many other countries are doing these habitat mapping uh, programs to basically produce maps of the types of communities and ecosystems that you find on the seabed. We've got a question about the field of view that we've got with the various cameras. I mean, this 4K camera we can zoom in and out, but I mean, do we know what the average field of view is for the HD camera, which is the main view? That's a question for our ROE technicians. <laughs> Yeah, the field of view of the camera, how far? Oh. It used to be. How is the cost? Well, I think when Seven, I think... 70 degrees. Yeah, yeah. Seven, 70, 70 degrees field of, field of view. Um, yeah, this one here. 
Uh, now you can see us uh, um, picking out the sample and putting it into one of our sample trays. It's very delicate work. Somebody's asking, can we estimate how old these sponges are? Well, I guess probably from images not, um, but I mean, sponges grow, grow very slowly. A, a lot of the species here grow very slowly. So, and this is a very established community. So, um, I wouldn't like to hazard a guess, but they're not new. <laughs> yeah, it's a very difficult group to uh, age. There's yeah. really much that can rely on. It's, no, there's, there's no real method to age a sponge that I'm aware of. Yeah. With with other with other organisms such as corals, um, you can uh, you can uh, use techniques such as carbon dating on the on the solid uh, body of the animals, and uh, uh, that's been used on on many corals to show that they can live to uh, beyond thousands of years. Yeah, in some, in some corals, you, they also have like a year rings in the stem, yeah. like trees. Yeah, they have rings like trees. Yes. Yeah. Well, that can be used also as an indicator, mm. but that doesn't apply for all of them. It's just some types of coral trees. Yeah. But one way that we can have an idea is that when we put uh, man-made structures in some places, uh, or where there's a, uh, for example, a ship that went down, then we can we know that there's a brand new surface, and then if we visit some time later, we can actually measure and get an idea of how much the, those animal sponges have grown since uh, and that type of work has been done for example in places where they put uh, um, oil platforms or, or pipes uh, but that will give you only like a very big um, estimation of, of the age of those animals. Well we tried to, to look at a platform that had been deposited 20 years ago yesterday but we couldn't find it. Yeah. I suspect it's probably been grown over so much that you wouldn't have been able to see yeah. it. Yeah, maybe, or maybe it just uh, it was it's a small object that it was hard to find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, the seabed is a big place. Um, so uh, now we're going to just uh, uh, go off on a little bit of a wander and uh, <laughs> uh, or or conduct a, a, a transect, as as we like to call it. But seaweed there. Yeah, so it, it, it's amazing. We're um, uh, more than 100 kilometers offshore and uh, 600 meters deep, and we still see uh, bits of seaweed that have sunk and, and been um, washed across um, to, to the seabed here. So what um, other wildlife have we seen so far, apart from the invertebrates that we've been focusing on? Well, we've seen several types of fish. Um, they tend to hide or escape because uh, uh, I guess the ROV is a big and bright thing that scares them away. Um, we've seen also a lot of um, shrimp-like animals mm -hmm. in some places. Uh, in some situations where we have this, um, yeah, like small shrimp that get attracted by the light of the ROV more or less in the same way that moths get attracted to light inland. So in some places, uh, you know, you have a lot of movement on the screen because of that. So um, uh, th this kind of this kind of very um, structurally complex mm -hmm. habitat is, is a really good place for lots of sure. small mobile animals to be able to oh, okay. hide themselves and uh, go and uh, lay their eggs and that's one reason why it, it, it's it's important that we um, uh, well, document and try to conserve these habitats because these are really important nursery grounds for for many um, fish and crustaceans and uh, many of the things that we like to, to to fish and eat from the sea. had a question about all the echinoderms that we can see, so the brittle stars, sea stars, and um, I'm not sure if I've seen any um, sea cucumbers, but yeah, I mean, it's really difficult to ID them from images, um, but they uh, obviously are aggregated within these uh, high-density sponge grounds because there's a lot of food here, right? 
Ya. We've got a question about the camera. So, what kind of cameras do you use on the units? The pictures are very clear. They are. Oh well, oh, it's 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 good to hear that uh, that the stream is coming through clearly. Yeah. Uh, that's been a bit of a worry for us. Um, uh, so the, the so the, uh, the the smaller picture in picture camera is a 4K video, so super high definition. Um, it, it means kind of like a, a, a we very quickly rack up terabytes worth of um, 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 video files by by playing it, but it also means that when you play okay, it back, you uh, can zoom in closer. Sorry, um, uh, you can zoom in really close and get a really good idea on the detail. Oh, that's lovely. The, the uh, main camera is a, a high definition camera. Um, I don't know what uh, resolution that is. Uh, oh, standard high definition camera, yeah. Which itself is still pretty good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly, a lot better than the than the uh, homemade GoPro cameras that we've been using previously uh, in Greenland. <laughs> but it works. Yes, it um, works very well. It works. Yeah. It works really well. Um, um, but but you get what you pay for. <laughs> two, two million pounds buys you a lot of really good quality imagery. Yeah. Yeah, we are not used to to, uh, to get imagery of this quality in our uh, surveys either, and uh, has been yeah a source of wonder for the last few days. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been very difficult to go to bed when you're off shift because when the other team takes over and you feel like you're going to miss out seeing an amazing habitat. Um, we can stream these from our cabins, so a lot of us have been going to sleep with them uh, playing in the background. <laughs> But also happened that sometimes, you know, we've been on the seabed in a particular beautiful location. It's time to go up and go to the next place, but we don't want to. We want to keep watching and keep discovering the place. So somebody's asking, there don't seem to be many, many mollusks or crustaceans visible. Is that a surprise? Uh, a, a lot of the mollusks are quite small, um, and so they they can be uh, quite difficult to see. We have seen a few. Yeah. Um, a lot of the, we have a lot of squat lobsters and they've been hiding um, under rocks and within sponges. We can see, a, we can see an empty shell here. But yeah, um, I haven't seen as many um, squat lobsters in this station as no, we had in, no. in some of the others. But there are a few small tiny um, amphipods that are crawling on the other yeah. Well, we so far we have taken I think 16 or or 17 uh, ROV dives in this cruise, uh, and the diversity of the habitat has been really surprising. Um, we have been uh, there are very clear differences in the type of animals that we see in different places. Um, and that has been a, a very interesting part of, of this research. You can see here that we've uh, we've gone from that patch of brightly coloured, highly diverse organisms to uh, a much plainer um, uh, gravel bed. Uh, it kind of shows the dependency of many animals on on uh, the, the the seabed type, but it also shows how patchy and uh, th these habitats are. And we can go from a really dense sponge ground to a pretty flat um, gravel bed in the th in the space of a few meters, and uh, that makes uh, the job of uh, modelers like Julian all the more difficult. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Also, because there, you know, there's still a lot that we don't know about what what are the physical and chemical uh, properties of the habitats that influence the distribution of different animals.
Another uh, interesting thing in this type of habitat is the importance of rocks. In places where you have more soft sediment and you find uh, isolated rocks, rocks are almost like islands of life. Um, and they, are, they play a very important role in supporting communities of sponges and, and corals. And you can see it here uh, how uh, yeah, they are colonized by a bunch of different animals. Um, and sometimes when we sample, it's, it's easier just to grab a rock that is full of animals rather than trying to pick uh, the organisms by, by themselves. You can see here, though, how you have some things growing on top of other things. You know, so you, see you get this kind of little uh, um, uh, tower of organisms all, all living on top of each other. Are those polychaetes, little worms. That's his spider. He's really cool. Should we um, should we have a bit of a transit now, and yeah. maybe that'll increase our chances of seeing some fish? Yeah. Um, I, I imagine we've scared away all of the fish um, mm -hmm. with uh, sitting quite stationary for a while. Somebody said the purple is so vibrant, and um, yeah, in in this particular habitat, we've noticed that the these uh, soft corals are really vibrant here. It's a really pleasure to see for us, and such a healthy and vibrant and dense community. What do you enjoy most about being at sea? <laughs> oh, uh, the company of the people, the yeah, food. Yeah, good answer. <laughs> food has been really good. Uh, no, in, 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 and yeah, and the, the having the opportunity to see these habitats. Um, to me, this type of research is again, it's like exploration in the most basic sense. We are actually seeing places that nobody has seen before. Um, and that's always very exciting to me. What about you, Chris? What's your most favourite part about being at sea? Yeah, um, uh, I, 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 I'm going to have to um, mirror Julian's answer a bit there. Just uh, as certainly this cruise, the quality of the imagery has been uh, a, a really um, really amazing and it's been great to get such close and detailed view of, of the animals that we've seen um, um, a little bit more at distance previously. But this sort of paraphrasing Star Trek, this is uh, the seabed, the final frontier. <laughs> <laughs> and we are going to in places that, you know, we have not seen before. Oh, we've got one here. My father, Jonas is driving the ROV. Oh. I think the sea creatures are very cool. Slash four year old Scott. Oh. <laughs> Got a shout out. <laughs> well, we're really glad you're enjoying it, Scott. And um, your dad's looking after us. Yeah, he's doing an amazing job. Yeah. Yeah, I think I should extend that to the whole crew of the ship. 
Absolutely. Yeah, they, they have a you know a, a very high level of, of expertise and, and professionalism, and they have catered to every one of our whims and needs. We want to go here. We want to go there, and you know they have uh, taken us with you know a very high level of precision, and, and yeah, we're very thankful for that. So we have the question saying that uh, one of the viewers thought they saw a conch. Is that possible? I didn't realise that we had. Well, the, some of the mollusks look quite similar, but I'm not really sure that we have an ID for these. Do we? Sign us a conch. Is that what I call a conch snail? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the big snails that you can blow. Yeah. yeah. No. That's no. Um, not. Yeah. Um, must be something. Similar. A lot of the mollusks in this area aren't great, uh, haven't been hugely characterized to my um, awareness, but um, yeah, we'll probably do some work on the images once we've got them back and we're back on dry land to try and understand what's there. Uh, so another the question the here about how long are we away at C4 and what's the food like on board? <laughs> Who's the best cook? <laughs> <laughs> the food is amazing. Yes. We get cake at three o'clock every day, which is the best. Some time. of you are getting cake at three o'clock every day. <laughs> un unfortunately, um, uh, uh, some of us have to work night shifts, and uh, and uh, this time round, uh, Nanette and uh, uh, Laura and uh, Berger. Um, uh, we are sorry, missing Nanette, out on the cake. Uh, I'm missing out on the cake because they're sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Not today, maybe. Yes, yeah. no, I, Not today. No, that's to help us. Yeah, well, yeah. and actually not yesterday either, but that's another story. <laughs> I, pr I promised to get them cake and I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologise and I'll get it. <laughs> but the, the truth is that it, you know, food is really important in, in any ship. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in, uh, so I could, you know, it helps you to lift your spirits. It's not only nutrition, but also. Um, yeah, so it has been really, really good here. Yeah. So we're coming up on the hour of streaming, so we were aiming to stream consistently for around an hour today. So uh, if you guys have any last questions to ask us before we wrap up, please post them in the comments and we'll do our best to get through them. Uh, really beautiful picture. So. Yeah. Mm. Amazing animals. Uh Chris, your wife's saying don't trust him to deliver the cake. Oh <laughs> 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 uh, thanks. Lots of people saying um, amazing images and um, really nice habitats. Thank you all for your positive feedback. We are so excited to be here and so thankful that we've been given this opportunity. Anybody that works on deep sea images will know how difficult it can be. So uh, these have really given us um, a unique view at quite, uh, well, truly mysterious environments. Well, we're very happy that uh, we've been able to do this, and, uh, and thank you, Aaron and Chris, for organizing all this uh, um, live event. Well, it's yeah. an absolute pleasure. A, a big thanks to Emmy for that, <laughs> and, and okay. all the work that she's done. Yeah, she was amazing. Um, <coughs> are you going to talk about the Euroflix stream more? Um, we're, we're hoping, yes, yeah, yeah we, uh, we're going to do a couple of streams on Monday from the Eurofleet's page, so we'll post a link to it um, in the chat as well and in the event page. Uh, it won't be um, posted as it has been today, but if you're interested in just watching us in, in watching us do a few um, transects, then we'll be streaming the video live to you um, as long as the technology and the weather holds out. Now we're watching something different. So yeah. this is something different and um, we will hold off so we can have a look at this a bit more closely. This is not something that I've seen before. Mm. It's Except. quite an enemy like. Yeah. Oh. It looks like it's lost a few fingers. <laughs> yeah. 
Couldn't it be X actually? I think, yeah, they look like X. Could it be what? X X from Squid, maybe? So this potentially could be Squid Ed, X Ax. So here we have it. We can look at deep sea videos all day long. And we can see something that we've never seen before. Yeah. Yeah, they're eggs. I think that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I have to take a step. We're going to get the uh, vacuum out. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take let's take a little bit of that. So I think we'll wrap up the audio here for now. So thank you all for joining us, but we'll keep the live stream video on so you can see a sample, this quite unique um, object on the seafloor. We've got some speculation that it could be some kind of egg sac, um, but we'll keep streaming the video for a few minutes or so so you can keep up with us. But we will say goodbye from us. Yeah, goodbye. goodbye. Thank you for joining us, and it's been a pleasure.